Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 83rd virtual shadowing session. Tonight's session, we have a specialty spotlight in cardiology with Dr. Laura Co Collins. All right, next slide. Here is our virtual shutting working group, which includes Dr. Fowler, Dr. Marchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. <clears throat> Next slide. All right, here are our upcoming sessions. On January 11th, we have head and neck surgery. On January 18th, we have a specialty spotlight in neurosurgery. And on January 25th, we have a session over how to deal with the patient's death. All right, next slide. Just a friendly reminder, we will have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle and one at the very end. And the last announcement is we will have a, a link that will be sent at the end of the session and we are reopening session five quiz. All right, Dr. Fowler, do you have some announcements? Thank you, Elena, so much. And thank you all for coming. This has become a, just a very sentimental thing now that we've been here almost two years with you. And we've had over half a million viewings of the programs on the website. So we believe that there really is a demand, uh, a need for virtual observation of what goes on in the clinical environment so that young folks like yourself can make the decisions about what sort of career that they want in medicine, whatever that be, NP, PA, physician, tech, or whatever it is. So as we said before, if you keep coming back, we're going to be here. The, the test of us coming back will be that you continue to participate. We have about 3,000 people a week that view the recordings that we put online. And so it seems to be a very healthy number of folks that still look to us to provide an online virtual shadowing opportunity. Uh, Dr. Collins, is, whom you'll meet in a moment, uh, is with me on the admissions committee at UT Southwestern. And I would invite her to comment about, you know, the increasing frequency that we see in applicants to medical school now who put online virtual shadowing opportunities uh, onto their applications. And so, Elena, without any further ado, would you introduce our wonderful guest this evening? Yes, Dr. Col uh, Dr. Collins, I don't want to take too much of your time, but we are all very excited to hear your journey into cardiology. So with that being said, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd first like to start by thanking Dr. Fowler, Elena, and the entire committee. I can't believe what an outstanding job uh, you have all done. And this is the 83rd session. And I'm very honored and humbled to be part of that session and to get to meet all of you. So I hope to share with you tonight um, a couple different of things. I want to tell you what sort of a day in the life of a general cardiologist is, what we do, um, a little bit about um, my career path and my journey to medicine and then to cardiology. And then the shadowing part will end with a few of uh, cases that I've seen recently, some of them um, very common cases, some of them not so common. Um, and then end with time uh, for questions. So I hope everyone enjoys. Um, so I'm a general cardiologist and I have a non-invasive emphasis. And what that means is um, I am an imager. Um, I do I spend a lot of my time looking at hearts in different modalities, um, echo, um, CT, um, and we, we interpret, we diagnose, and we use that information then into caring for our patients every day. And what I love about general cardiology is that no two days are alike. Every day is different. It's a very diverse field. Um, we care both for patients that have a known cardiac diagnoses, but we also evaluate patients that may have symptoms that are concerned for cardiac disease. And this is done both in the inpatient setting and outpatient settings. So I know there's a little quiz at the end. I wanna tell you that none of what you see on this slide is included because I realize how busy and overwhelming it is, but I wanted to give you the breadth of common cardiac diagnoses uh, we can see. Um, coronary artery disease, including acute heart attacks, very common, congestive heart failure, 
Um, abnormal heart rhythms, um, both tachyarrhythmias, meaning fast heart rhythms and bradyarrhythmias or slow heart rhythms, uh, valvular heart disease, hypertension, pericardial and myocardial disease. The pericardium is the lining around the heart. So you can actually get disease and inflammation of that. And the myocardium, which is the muscle of the heart also can become inflamed or infiltrated with certain um, uh, substances. Um, endocarditis, which is part of valvular disease is an infection of the inner lining of the heart. And that can include the heart valves, as well as the lining in any of the chambers of the heart. Um, congenital heart disease, um, we actually see this as adults. Now, of course, you're born with that heart disease. Many of these people as children have gone on and had surgeries and procedures, but eventually when they get into their sort of late teens, early 20s, the pediatric cardiologist turns them over to um, an adult congenital specialist. And we have um, uh, three people, four people actually, I think now at UT uh, that focus on adult congenital heart disease. But sometimes as a general cardiologist, you will run into this, um, one of these patients um, because they may not even know they had disease as a child. So you do have to be familiar with all of these abnormalities that you could have. We focus a good deal of time on prevention, mostly in the outpatient setting, screening people um, and treating people that don't have heart disease, but maybe have high cholesterol, a family history of heart disease, um, hypertension. And we do try to do do measures to help people stop smoking, um, of course, which is a big cause of coronary disease, uh, and also identify family history and people um, that are at risk for heart disease, because that may play into how aggressive we are in treating them. We also deal with diseases and injury of the aorta, which is a big blood, the major blood vessel that comes off the heart and supplies um, uh, the rest of the body with blood. Um, and then of course, um, the patients that don't necessarily have known heart disease, but come in concerned because they may have chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, or fainting spells, which I'll refer to several times during the talk. And that's the word syncope, which essentially means passing out with loss of consciousness. So as a general cardiologist, my day can be split up between many different um, tasks. Some of those will be with um, trainees, like my cardiology fellows, or they could be with house staff, like the interns and residents, or medical students. Uh, for instance, tomorrow I'll be at Parkland in the echo lab, and I'll be performing transesophageal echoes, interpreting transthoracic echoes. Um, the difference is the transthoracic echo is done by a sonographer and is from the chest wall, whereas transesophageal is what it sounds like. We insert a probe into the esophagus, which lies behind the heart, and we can take very detailed pictures from that ultrasound crystal at the tip of the probe. Stress tests will be interpreted, um, EKGs, um, other days I may have direct patient care duties on the wards or in the intensive care unit, which we call the coronary care unit in cardiology, um, or duties in the outpatient clinic. Um, I already mentioned having uh, fellows and house staff, which is a great honor uh, because it keeps all of us fresh and everybody you know, at UT and Parkland and the VA where I, where I work, all of the house staff are so inquisitive and they really keep you on your toes and they're all excellent. So we learn from each other. Um, so that teaching can go on bedside, at the bedside, maybe in the echo lab or during procedures or during formal lectures. And then lastly, in every, any day you have administrative duties and research duties working on manuscripts um, or collaborating with colleagues. And so you can see how varied the day is. And this is, I should say the day 
of a academic general cardiologist. If you were in private practice, this day may look a little different, um, but there are groups that are hybrid groups in private practice, and they may focus more on research and they may have teaching responsibilities. So there is some overlap there. And I get to work at three flagship hospitals. It's just a real honor. Um, I split my time between um, the UT campus and the Dallas VA campus. Um, I don't know if many of you have been down to uh, South Dallas, but the uh, the VA campus is very large and in cardiology, it's one of the, I think the second largest program um, in the country in cardiology at, at VAs. Um, of course, uh, I've already mentioned being at Parkland, the new Parkland Hospital has just under 900 beds, I believe. And it's, it's just both um, the Parkland Hospital and Clements University Hospital were built within the last five years and we transitioned into these uh, facilities and they, they both are really truly a pleasure to work um, at. But more than just the buildings, of course, it's the people inside that make up all of my colleagues, um, the nursing staff, the nurse practitioners, the physician's assistants, all our ancillary staff. Uh, everybody's truly wonderful and makes for a pleasant uh, work experience and our wonderful colleagues. So I mentioned a little bit about academic versus private practice. Your clinical work is pretty similar. Um, in academics, you may have more supervision and teaching of the trainees than you would in a private practice setting. Uh, committee work tends to be a little heavier in academics, like Dr. Fowler already mentioned, and that can happen locally. Um, you know, at the medical school or even at the hospital, you may have committees that you sit on, or it can happen at the state level or national level um, and with your professional societies um, that need people on their boards. I already mentioned the research component. And like I said, this can be um, both, there are definitely people at UT that work um, within cardiology that are almost 100% research, whereas many of us are closer to 100% clinical. Um, so everybody's day looks a little bit different um, and that's the fun of it. So, um, you're all out there wondering, is cardiology for me? Is that something I want to consider? So I try to think about things. And what I think, you know, you must absolutely love is you must love the heart. You have to love cardiovascular uh, physiology, pathology, um, to, you know, really get excited about taking care of the patients that have these abnormalities. Um, like in math and physics, I think you have to, because there's so much math and physics within uh, cardiology, um, algebra fit and calculus. Um, you have to like a fast paced, paced practice. We have a very high volume of patients, both in the hospital and out of the hospital. Um, you have to think comprehensively on your feet, meaning you have to really do a rapid eval of your patients, particularly when they're in the hospital, coming in very sick. Um, you have to really synthesize what's going on with them, not just with their heart, but really obviously with their entire uh, organ systems. Um, and you have to have the confidence to really make those life and death decisions. Um, I listed three of obviously the main emergencies we may run into as a cardiologist, um, including um, the most uh, fatal cardiac arrest, but we may have sort of less or emergent, but still urgent situations like electrical emergencies, abnormal heart rhythms um, that have to be dealt with immediately. So you have to recognize, you have to know how to treat. We can have mechanical emergencies and, and this is where our heart failure team comes in um, because most of those mechanical emergencies um, involve heart failure patients. Uh, and you obviously have to enjoy the care of the critically um, ill patient. So what to expect with a career? Um, I kind of put this into benefits and challenges. So, and I think they balance each other out. You know, well, I'll start with the benefits first. You know, you have an awesome opportunity to provide life-saving care to your patients 
in the time that they're very vulnerable. But then you get to follow those patients longitudinally in the outpatient setting and see their recovery and um, their sort of path back to health. We deal with both primary and secondary prevention, meaning reducing heart disease risk in patients that don't have a known diagnosis, but also helping patients that do have a diagnosis prevent another event from occurring. Um, another benefit, I think, is that in the past two decades, we've seen an explosion in the evolving research uh, for the clinical care of our patients, both in um, pharmacotherapy, um, particularly in the heart failure uh, section, and also valvular heart disease. Um, we have procedures that can be done now percutaneously rather than open surgical procedures. Um, and of course, the other benefit is you get to work with just phenomenal um, uh, colleagues. And I already mentioned, that's what really makes up the buildings I showed you. But what about the challenges? And are the benefits enough to sort of balance those challenges? Um, yeah, I, I have to admit, um, patient mortality is one of the real challenges. In adult cardiology, you're dealing with older patients, um, so you will have life loss. Um, this past year and a half has been particularly hard uh, due to COVID, and I can say um, the in the past year and a half, I think I've lost more patients than I've lost my entire career, which is very sad. Well, you know, Laura, you know, Laura, I was reading today in one of the journals that people even monitoring their own blood pressure at home has plunged during the COVID mm -hmm. era. People just either not able or just losing the desire to take the care desire. of themselves. Sure. Yeah, I can I can see that, but it, it's been it has been a rough year, particularly this year and a half. Um, call is 24 seven. So someone has to be there, whether if it's not you, it's one of your colleagues. Um, and of course the stress, because we are dealing mostly with emergency situations. Um, one particular challenge for me in my career has been the limitation of resources, both at our county hospital, Parkland and the VA hospital. Um, we have a lot of support, but there are some things that we don't have for patients at those hospitals. Um, and one in particular for me is advanced therapies and heart failure, um, such as LVADs, which are assist devices that help patients um, that are in need of a transplant that needs more support right now. Um, and then um, heart transplant evals for the many young patients at Parkland are not a possibility, um, those that don't have insurance. And so that's some real limitation and that brings um, a lot of sadness to us uh, that take care of patients there. Um, high patient volume is, um, is definitely there. I don't think, you know, um, coronary disease unless COVID has outpaced it, um, has been the leading cause of death in this country um, for, for decades. Um, and that high patient volume is unfortunately probably not, it's not going away. Now, for the women in the audience, um, one challenge is that despite the fact that we've seen more um, young people um, coming into our fellowships, we were right now, I think females make up about 20% in the United States of any uh, of fellowships uh, to train cardiologists. Our workforce still only has 13 to 14% overall female cardiologists. And so that's definitely a challenge that many of us are actively trying to and sort of bring more balance um, because I think females do bring a lot to the table for our patients, particularly the female patients, not to say that, the, that our male colleagues don't, um, but I think we're, we're all striving for that balance. So that's another- Laura, what do you think, what do you think has led to the presence of- Ooh, That's a whole nother talk, Ray. Um, okay. I, I, okay. I, yeah, there are there are many, and maybe in the in the chat we can uh, we we can chat more about that. Um, okay. But the, there are both biological factors, and then what I call the outside forces um, that perhaps have have led to that, and misperceptions. I think um, so. Um, 
going on a little bit about um, training. So what do you have to do to um, get to the point of applying for your cardiology fellowship and becoming a general cardiologist? Well, um, like any medical school um, requirement, you need a four-year college degree. So either a BS or a BA um, from a four-year school. Um, Pre-med courses, uh, the prerequisites are, of course, necessary. The MCAT from most schools. There are a couple med schools now, I think, that don't actually require it, but the majority of schools in the U.S. still require the uh, medical college admissions test. Um, of course, four years of medical school and then an internal medicine residency is required. And that is generally three years um, before you can then train, apply and train for cardiology fellowship. Now I told that, was told that people were interested to sort of see where the speakers have trained. So I kind of just threw my path up there. Um, I, I went and did my college um, at Wellesley College and then went to medical school in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. Um, my internship, my residency was a little split up, a little non-traditional. I did my internship at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. Then um, my residency, um, the two last years of my residency, I was at Mass General in Boston. Um, and then I went and stayed in Boston for my cardiology fel fellowship at, at Beth Israel. Um, so that was my, my academic path, but now I wanted to give you more of a personal insight into my journey. I grew up in, um, in Boston and I was, um, the oldest of five children. And, you know, when I look back, I realized how much I was influenced by my upbringing and my mom was just very big on disease prevention. She grew up at a time uh, when the polio vaccine was not available, um, when many of her friends actually suffered and from rheumatic fever and then got rheumatic heart disease. So she was adamant. I can still remember having all five kids have their vaccine books lined up, going to the pediatrician. Um, and then of course, if we had even the quiver of a sore throat or a fever, we were in making sure we didn't have strep throat. So I, I really remember that and looking back um, how her experience, I think growing up sort of changed her and it led her to um, um, be very just dogmatic about that. And I, I know she's no longer with us, but I think if she were here today, she would just be just appalled at people that were not getting the COVID vaccine. Um, as a child, I had a lot of allergies and they really didn't know what was causing them. And I required a lot of emergency room visits. So I spent a lot of time in the emergency room because we didn't have EpiPens back then. And I would you know, have anaphylaxis, which is you're dropping your blood pressure, you can't breathe. And um, it was quite dramatic. And so um, I eventually grew out of them, but I can remember distinctly one time being at my pediatricians and my father just was with, he was with me and asked them, well, what, you know, what, what can we do? These have to stop, you know, they're getting worse. And he just threw his hands up in the air and he said, why don't you just put her in a fishbowl? And I was like mortified. I just could not believe this. And I was only 10 and that comment stuck with me. And I remember thinking after having been exposed to like so many nice people in the emergency room and everything that if I ever became a doctor, I would never make a comment like that. Not even jokingly, because even to a 10 year old that really stuck. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't entirely, you know, I think that's where my, the seeds were kind of put, but I, I wasn't sure. I went to high school. I fell in love with all my STEM classes, um, especially chemistry. And my first mentor was definitely my high school chemistry teacher, Miss, Mrs. G. And I still keep in touch with her today. Uh, she was an ama amazing woman and uh, really encouraged all the women in the class, you know, with, with their STEM classes. And um, so that was a great experience and encouraged me to take AP courses, began looking at colleges. 
Um, so I did go to college, obviously, and chemistry stayed with me. I majored in chemistry and just loved chemistry. Um, did research in organic chemistry, but then decided maybe physical chemistry might be safer after I kind of blew up one experiment. Um, I thought organic chemistry was a little dangerous, um, but I, I just loved my time in the lab um, and thinking about um, um, chemistry and what it could bring uh, to sort of society. Um, so I was really between, you know, my interest was definitely there with med school versus grad school. And my thesis advisor turned out to be my second mentor. And that was Professor Kay. She was just an outstanding woman and opened a lot of doors, you know, got me thinking about, you know, the pros and cons of considering both med school and grad school. So then it was my Spanish, I, I continued my uh, learning of Spanish when I was in college that really kind of prompted me to sort of actually make a medical decision about what I wanted to do. And that was, I had to do a project um, over like um, winter break and I volunteered to translate in an emergency room in Boston um, to improve my conversational Spanish. And that was actually um, Mass General. And this is a very fast paced emergency room. And um, so I was getting to translate for doctors and nurses and patients. And I was just fascinated by the rapid eval of patients in the emergency room and how quickly they could figure out what was going on. Um, the patients were very ill um, and yet they were getting them on the path to getting better. And I just, fell in love with sort of the rush of the emergency room um, and the ability for the team to really care for that patient and get them on the, the road to health, whether it was going home or whether they had to be admitted. Um, so I really began thinking about a career in medicine more earnestly. I completed my thesis, my MCATs prerequisites, and then I wanted to, even though my, my time of my project was over, I wanted to really stay and continue to work in the same emergency room. So I took whatever job I could get, and that was as the clerk in the emergency room, because I had a bird's eye view of everything that was going on. And I really wanted to make sure this is what I wanted to do. And there really back then weren't a lot of shadowing opportunities. You had to be I guess, creative. I also took a part-time job at an adolescent psychiatric hospital, and that was also very eye-opening. Um, so I did apply to medical school and I did go. <laughs> and um, I had a great time in medical school. I um, you know, exposed myself to a wide array of both clinical and research experiences. But importantly, I found balance because you quickly learn with the volume of material you have to digest in medical school, you need balance. And so I found that in friends, my family, even though they were back in the Boston area, I found time to go to go visit. I took up racquetball. I played intramural volleyball. My friends and I in medical school, we had one person that really liked square dancing. So we all went square dancing. I even ran into patients while we were doing that uh, and traveled. Um, I volunteered. Um, I volunteered with children displaced from their homes in Baltimore uh, due to lead, uh, high levels of lead. And they were undergoing treatment at the Kennedy Center at Hopkins. And so that was uh, fascinating to me. Um, you know, and not only was I getting to you know, have a look into how they were treating um, these children that had high lead levels, they couldn't go back to their home. Um, but we also got to provide them sort of activities away from their home in lead free environments. So I was really torn between pediatrics versus internal medicine. Um, and Finally, internal medicine uh, won out, but I did a lot of rotations in pediatrics to help make that decision. And then when I left medical school, I had thought really my number one um, uh, interest was cardiology, but I also was entertaining hematology, oncology, or rheumatology. Um, so sub all subspecialties within internal medicine. And then I learned a very valuable lesson. Um, I worked with a very world-renowned uh, rheumatologist and I 
very closely. I thought, you know, we had a good month together and I asked her for a letter of support, um, you know, for of recommendation for applying for internal medicine residency. So when I first met with her to talk about that, I was, you know, I had already told her the reason for the meeting was that I would like to have a letter from her. Um, and during our discussion, she discouraged me from pursuing a clinical career in cardiology because she thought it was too technical of a career for a woman. And that thought always stuck with me. Um, and I let her write the letter. Um, I think in retrospect, I may have backed out um, if I had been wiser because I'm not sure what she said in that letter, but um, I, I didn't feel supported obviously, but I felt kind of trapped because I had already asked for the letter. Um, so I, I, I did train in internal medicine, went three years, and that was a very fast three years, I can say. Um, I started with my internship in St. Louis at um, Barnes Hospital, which is part of um, WashU, and had, had a great time. Um, and because my husband-to-be and I were chasing each other around the country for like seven years by then, um, we both decided we needed to be in the same city. And so um, I did something non-traditional for that time in that I left my internship and applied uh, sort of outside the match and everything to residency spots that were available. And lo and behold, I had come full circle and I landed back in Boston at Mass General. Uh, and my husband luckily had a job opportunity there as well. And it was there that my interest in cardiology was solidified. And again, it was in the emergency room. It was when I was seeing patients come in with acute MIs, uh, heart attacks. And at that Point, we were able to give thrombolytic therapy to lyse the clot uh, that was obstructing their coronary and improve their um, overall medical um, condition. And by the end of my residency, we were taking them to the cath lab and we were actually able to directly uh, put a balloon down their coronary and reperfuse um, the blood to the myocardium that was being um, underperfused, causing the heart attack. So it was a very exciting time. And I just said, this is, this is it. You know, if, if cardiology is going in this direction and we're not just sitting around watching people have heart attacks and become cardiac cripple, cripples, I want to be part of it. And so with that, I applied to cardiology fellowships. I snuck getting married in there because after, after seven years, I don't think my husband was going to wait anymore at that point. Um, and so it was a fast three years. Um, I had a gap year because of my move between um, St. Louis and Boston. I felt I wanted to delay my application a little bit for fellowship. So I did a year of research in uh, vascular biology as, as well before uh, beginning fellowship. And so I went on to Beth Israel in Boston to do my fellowship. And I was to begin, I began my fellowship July 1st and lo and behold, life happens. And my first son was born on July 3rd. Um, but I arranged to do my research time up front. And so I had to, um, time, time to um, acclimate um, and do work at home as far as reading up on experiments I wanted to do and the background literature and be home with my son for the first uh, three months of his life. Um, I then completed four years of fellowship with extra training in ECHO. And by the end of um, my fellowship and I graduated uh, June 1st, my second son was born July 6th. And I had already accepted a job by this time in San Antonio and at the School of Medicine there. And they were gracious enough to say, hey, take the time that you need before you start. And so I did because we had a move to St. Louis. And so, um, you know, I, I took off a, a good five months at that point uh, and then started my first real job as an assistant professor of medicine there. Did a mix of both clinical work and research. I had a training grant uh, from the American Heart Association for junior faculty um, and had just a great time. Those, we were in, Saint Louis, uh, in San Antonio for eight years. And then it was 18 years ago that I came up to Dallas and took my second job here and I'm still here. Um, 
So I think we are at the point for our first Q and A. Laura, we have we have so many questions about you and your background and how cardiology appealed to you and <clears throat> and I've been in I've been practicing medicine almost forty five years and I remember a long time before echocardiography was ever available and the thought that we would jam a catheter down the coronary artery of someone having a fresh acute MI. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And the, you know, kids, a kid is a compliment in this group, kind of take things for granted because they are, they always have been, but that's not at all the case. It was only about 20 years ago that we started taking people to the cath lab for an acute MI, which means oh, in my world- A little bit more than that. I'd say 30. Well, well, yeah, a wrinkle, more, but I mean, even when I when I when I first when I first got to Parkland, Laura, 21 years ago, we were doing the immediate trial, which was giving glucose, insulin and potassium infusions to patients having an acute MI. Right. Because we, we at that time didn't have uniform methods to be able to open up their arteries. So we thought maybe we could at least nourish sure. the dead dying cells, which turns out it doesn't work, or at least in our hands. It didn't yeah. Work. So what yeah. appeal do you about the heart as the second most central organ, I guess, maybe to the brain, but <laughs> to the body, it's number one. But anyway, I missed the first part. Did you say what drew me? No, to the only in this, as what led you then to cardiology? What was the burning passion? I think right. all the way back, Augustus Waller in the 1880s and his dog, Jimmy, and then Villa Meinfoven and people that came after that. Right you know, who developed the whole field. And what was it at your stage yeah. that said, I need to do this? What was that? I, well, I, I, you know, when I was in medical school and I was doing my radiology elective, um, everybody had to do a, a talk at the end of radiology elective. And so I ended up doing sort of a non-traditional talk, I guess, for radiology because I did um, the history of the first angioplasty done by uh, by Dr. Grunzik way back way back when. Um, Emory University, right here in Atlanta. Yep. And so I, you know, I saw the potential back then when I was a medical student, and that's really what started to spur me into thinking because, you know, when I was in medical school, you know, having a heart attack meant that that they taught you, okay, well, you know, you can die from this complication, this complication, and this complication. Um, and maybe you can prevent it by lowering cholesterol, but there was like, you know, yeah, you could shock the heart if it went into an abnormal rhythm, but there was nothing about, you know, we could open the artery. Um, and so I think I was really hooked after doing the research and doing my talk Nevertheless, in a radiology elective, um, I, I got the bug and cardiology is so diverse, right? Because it is a meld of looking at not just um, the electrical conduction, but you have the valves that can be diseased. You have the muscle that can be diseased and nothing is an isolation. It all has to work together. And so it's a very complex symphony as you have it. Um, and it, it's almost like a bit of a mystery to figure out, well, you know, is the valve the primary issue here or is that the muscle and how should we treat that patient? And it, it fascinated me right from the beginning, you know, um, right from the pressure volume loops that you get in your first year of medical school when you're learning about, you know, cardiac physiology. Um, so I, I was hooked pretty early on, but really what solidified it was during my residency when, and, and I can tell you what, and Ray, you're going to think that this is so nerdy, but we didn't have any, we had a journal club, but it was internal medicine. So there were five or six of us in my, um, residency year that really were interested in cardiology. So we used to do an after hours nighttime journal club, looking at all the thrombolytic trials and everything. 
And everybody in that group, we all went on to do cardiology. We all remained in academics. And so, um, you know, I think it was, you know, there was a lot of excitement. It was a very exciting time to ch- to train. Um, and I never regretted the decision. You know, Laura, you had to be fairly self-taught in echocardiography, right? Because it was fairly new getting into, I mean, we were barely doing ultrasound 40 okay, years. Right. I'm not that old. <laughs> well, you finished high school what time? I know there were people that came before me that taught me echo. Um, I think transesophageal echo was just kind of getting going at that time. But, um, you know, definitely I had great guidance during my fellowship from some of the greatest giants, um, you know, that walked the echo pathways um, before me. And, and so um, I, I had form, formal training, but I was very motivated as well. That's why I did extra, extra time in echo. So Laura, do you still listen to the heart with a stethoscope? Oh, silly, silly question all the time. No, no. Huh? All, all, even though I have the ability to put an echo probe on, I think auscultation is, you know, first of all, I don't want to lose that art. And second of all, you know, I think um, the echo, you know, can sometimes overestimate uh, just if you do a quick look, um, but really hearing what's going on in your patient's chest, um, you, you typically can't hear or see an S3 gallop um, when you put an echo probe. You can see a bad heart function, but you know, there are just certain things you can glean from a physical exam that you can't necessarily get from, from an echo. So I asked that because, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and me too. And I have a good stethoscope. I, but I know physicians in my field of emergency medicine who don't even carry a stethoscope. You know, they look at the work of breathing and so on and so on. That's, and so how I think this it's field sad. Yeah. Well, yeah, but how the field seems to continue to evolve, right or wrong. <clears throat> and I wonder if the device of the future is a combination of an, of, of an electrocardiogram, an echocardiogram, and a stethoscope, mm-hmm. and that we will have holographic 4D images <clears throat> that will have to have artificial intelligence to interpret them because it'll have so much information on them. The EKG alone has so sure. much information. Mm. Sure. Anyway, didn't mean to butt in. Elena, I know you've got a bunch of questions for Dr. Collin. All right. Yes, we do have a lot of questions. One question that we have that Dr. Fowler brought up earlier in the session is what factors <clears throat> do you think have led to the presence of very few female cardiologists? Right. So I mentioned a little bit about internal sort of biologic um, uh, pieces that may go into that decision. Um, So when you think about it, our average fellow, by the time they get into training, they're already in their early 30s, right? And for a woman's reproductive years, the clock is ticking, I think, after that 30-year mark passes. And so there was this, uh, you know, conception that you couldn't have children if you're going to train in cardiology, that, you know, that had to wait till after your training. And I think most of that came from um, the concern about uh, radiation exposure in the cath lab and the EP lab. Um, So I, I think that 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 definitely was something that was overblown because um, when I was in training, it was all, uh, we were always told if you were pregnant, you had to have, you know, make sure you have, were double leaded, meaning we wear lead aprons to protect us from the radiation. Uh, you had to have like a radiation <clears throat> badge outside and then inside. And I can t- tell you, it was kind of crazy wearing that double lead because, you know, one single lead apron and vest was heavy enough. And then you've got the extra weight of the baby. And, um, but the studies they've done since then do not really support um, the need to do that. And there are many um, women that have gone through, you know, a pregnancy and have not pulled themselves out of the cath lab or the EP lab. Um, and, you know, have would monitor the amount of radiation they get. And it doesn't seem to be an issue. Now, 
there are still many, many women that train, that decide they don't want to even have that in the equation. And so they just really plan their rotations around their time in the cat, you know, um, around the pregnancy so that they're not in the cath lab um, necessarily the time that they're um, most vulnerable during their pregnancy. Um, it's a little probably a more of a challenge if you've already finished your training and you're out and you're an interventional cardiologist, which means that you are cathing all the time uh, or um, doing interventions and so have longer exposures. Um, and there's a lot of debate there about whether you should cut back some time. Certainly the monitoring of your exposure is really important. But um, I think that, you know, a lot of the concern and why women were not going in was initially it was really frowned upon for women to even be in the cath lab. Um, and so, but when things were put into perspective and studies were done, that I think has sort of the tide has changed a bit. Um, the other, the other thing is that, you know, it's a demanding subspecialty and you have call at night and on weekends. Um, and so, the, you know, the, um, there was, you know, this conception that you couldn't have a child possibly and do this, um, as well because of the demand. And so that influence, I think like from the person I asked for a letter when I was um, in medical school, I think kind of persisted. Um, so unfortunately, you know, that persisted and was sort of an outside influence on um, trying to get those women that, that were very capable training in internal medicine to apply for fellowship. If you have your mentors and your superiors with that type of an attitude, uh, you've got to be pretty strong to persist through that. Um, and, you know, you need to have role models, right? It's, um, I didn't meet my first woman cardiologist until I was in fellowship. So before fellowship, um, I did not have true role models that were female in cardiology. I had male role models, but no female. Um, so I think that's been a benefactor as well. Um, and I, you know, it's just taken um, a long time for us to even sort of change that thought process. <coughs> Excuse me. But those, those are some of the factors I think that have led in to women sort of having a lower enrollment uh, within the cardiology fellowship. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. I would have never thought um, that would have never crossed my mind. So mm -hmm. uh, another question we have is how frequently are you on call? And out of the days you are on call, how often do you actually have to go into the hospital? That's a very good question. So, um, you know, it depends. And for me being in academics, it, it really depends upon the month. Like if I'm in say the intensive care unit, um, for a month, I may be on call two out of the four weekends, um, but then I may not have call again for a couple months. So I, I would say on average in a, in a year's time, if we're talking about like weekend call in the intensive care unit, probably not more than eight times in a year. I, I, I haven't really counted them up recently. Um, and it depends how big your practice is too. Everybody's call is going to be a little different. Now you take call during the week as well, but that's more um, emergent call. Like I could be on call for echo. Um, and unless I have to do a transesophageal echo, I can read echoes from home, which is a big plus, right? Um, that, that used to not be a possibility, but now we can, I can do that at all three hospitals. And so for a trans thoracic echo, I wouldn't necessarily go into the hospital just for the trans esophageal. Um, and I would say a few times a year, I get called in at night. So this, this doesn't include the daytime call on the weekends, but um, you know, maybe a couple times a year, you're actually physically going in for echo call. Now, as far as going in for just patients in the unit call, um, 
you know, my, I, on the weekends when I'm on call, I'm pretty much stationed at the hospital during the day. I don't usually leave until five or six at night. We try to kind of tuck everybody in. Um, and then, you know, at night, it's mostly conversations um, with the fellow who's on call. They're sort of the first call that they go in, see the patient, um, you know, and it may be, you know, again, maybe a couple to a few times a year that after I've left the hospital on the weekends that I'll be going back. Um, so it's a little bit different call structure than like an interventional cardiologist, because I'm not the one that if they have an acute MI come in, that I have to be in there to open up their artery. Um, you know, I, I, so their call is a little different than ours. They don't necessarily take call in the CCU on the weekends because their call happens whenever they're needed to come in and do a procedure. So I hope that answers the question. But it's variable depending upon where you practice. Okay. And then to follow up with the question, um, are you able to have a good life work balance a work, a good work life balance with it? Yeah, you really, you have to work at it. Um, you have to set boundaries, which in the world of texting and, um, E email or everybody having everybody's phone numbers, that can be a, a little bit challenging, um, but you need to carve out time for your family. So um, when my children were like growing up, I always had a rule that we never took staycations because if you were out of town, you're really, really not accessible for people. Um, and then I find too, when you stay in, stay in town for vacations, you end up doing things like errands mm -hmm. and you're not really actively vacationing. And so that was kind of always a rule. We were always doing something, whether it was skiing or going to the beach um, or just traveling to a new city or a new country, you know, you just want to, you know, structure that time so you can really spend the time with your family. Um, and then I think, again, having hobbies is, is very important um, and being creative too, um, you know, doing things that are sort of outside of, of medicine where things can get, you know, kind of technical and lots of paperwork and whatnot, but, um, you know, finding your outside um, interest. And of course, having a pet is always a great way to, to escape. So yes, I think uh, work-life balance has to be worked. It doesn't just come. You have to, you have to structure it. You have to carve it out. Okay. And then I'll do one more question uh, before mm -hmm. I let you move on. Sure. Uh, one question we have is, um, how do you deal with the stress or heartache of losing a patient? Yeah, very, very good question and insightful. Um, I call their families and I talk with them and I cry with them because it doesn't always happen uh, when you're with the family, right? It doesn't always happen acutely when they're in the hospital. Like I'll get a call that one of my patients that I've followed for 10 or 15 years came in for an appointment that wasn't cardiology related and, you know, had sudden cardiac death in the parking lot. And I find out about it the next day or the day after, you know? And so I typically, I, I call the families and we just talk about it. Um, and I think, you know, they really appreciate that. Um, and I also send usually a follow-up uh, card and letter and, I let my staff know too, so that if they want to reach out um, and talk to the family, because, you know, your nurses and everybody from your nurses to your scheduler, they've all been a part of that patient's care. And so I think it really helps the family as they're working through the grief. Um, and, you know, uh, we do that in, in the hospital too. Like if it's a patient that I have in common with my uh, house staff, with my fellows, um, you know, we, we talk about that loss. I mean, first we talk about sort of the medical, you know, what could we have done differently? Was there anything that could have prevented this? And we do all that. Um, but then, you know, especially if it's been a patient who has been on service 
with us a long time, it gets, it gets harder because you get to know that patient, you get to know their families. Um, and, and so having that discussion again, sort of involving as many people, the nurses in the ICU and everything, um, I think it helps everybody work through it, you know, myself included. Um, so I think it's the, the hard time I was referring to during COVID was just the sheer number of um, my personal patients that I had followed for years that were dying at such a rate. Um, it was, you know, whether that was from COVID or it was from delay in care, we saw both. So, Laura, where did you, where or when did you learn the skill about controlling the closeness that you get to your patients? Because mm. when you're with somebody for years and you've been with them and they've right. committed so much to maintaining wellness mm -hmm. and you have committed so much to helping them and then something happens. Um, how do you measure how much, how close that you get to a patient? Yeah, that's, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I can tell you, um, you know, I don't routinely give my cell phone out to patients, um, on, on rare occasion, there have been times that are usually, um, there's something crucial that I need that patient to be able to contact me directly about. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, that's one measure I've been asked for my cell phone many, many times. Um, but I do most of the time draw, draw the line unless I deem it e extremely necessary to do that. Um, but it's hard. I think it's hard. Um, if you're a human not to get too close, so to say, so to speak, um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, and you know, I, I value, you know, I feel very privileged to have cared for patients, especially for a long time. Yeah, I, uh, I can think back a long, long, I remember things in my mind, sort of like videos, and I suspect you do also. And the first patient that I ever told, told that he had unresectable cancer and was very likely to die and, and so on and so on in these very difficult situations that we've had. But also, Laura, maybe that they're set apart in a way from some of the occasional profound successes that we have where mm -hmm. people get a lot, they get a lot better. Right, <laughs> right. They go praise the Lord and, uh, yes. you know, because it does work. It just doesn't work all the time, but it, Correct. the medicine does work. Correct, correct. Well, Dr. Collins, you've been going for an hour. Did you even know that? Do you want to take a sip of water or? I already did. I, I have right. sipped. I have sipped, and I want to share um, a few cases, and then would you ha have another session? We are having a wonderful time with you, and thank you so much. Just take it away. All right, I'm going to start um, with our first case, and this is uh, Mr. And this is a recent case that we had at the VA. And Mr. O.W. is a 74-year-old man with a history of HIV on retroviral therapy latent tuberculosis and recent COVID pneumonia, uh, who's now requiring home oxygen. He gets readmitted to the hospital due to generalized weakness and shortness of breath. On physical examination, his blood pressure is normal, but his heart rate is a bit elevated at 114. He's a little tachypnic, his respiratory rate is 22. He's afebrile and he has a normal oxygen saturation. He is ill appearing on exam, but otherwise his exam, particularly his cardiac exam was unremarkable. Um, he in the emergency room is diagnosed with a urinary tract infection by having large bacteria in the urine and white cells. His urine culture ultimately grew enterococcus faecalis, as did his blood cultures uh, were positive for the same bacteria. Now this bacteria is concerning uh, because it is in the elderly population, a common cause of infective endocarditis. In fact, it causes anywhere in the literature between five to 20% of cases of endocarditis. And if you remember from 
my original session at the beginning, endocarditis is an infection of the heart valves or in any of the surfaces that line the heart or the endocardium. So an echocardiogram was done because of this incidence of um, endocarditis with this bacteria, because, you know, the infectious disease doctors are wondering, do we need to treat him for urinary tract infection, which would not be a very lengthy therapy, and he and urosepsis, what we call the bacteria in the blood, or has this bacteria gone and done more? Has it infected his heart valves? So on the surface echo, what we see, this is his aortic valve here. And the aortic valve leaflets should be relatively thin. Now in a 75 year old man, they may be a little bit thickened, but there also looks like maybe there's something mobile besides the leaflet hanging off. So this was a little suspicious. And then when we put color on, we see that there is a bit of leak. This blue color is blood leaking backwards, which it shouldn't do. And that is called regurgitation or leakage from the aortic valve back into the left ventricle, which is down here. Um, but from this, we couldn't really make a diagnosis whether this patient had endocarditis. We could say it was concerning maybe, but it wasn't enough. So we went on to do uh, a transesophageal echo, which you see in this picture. And I've just taken the zoomed in views. But this is that same view we saw in transthoracic, but now we're seeing it in more detail. And this is a very ugly looking aortic valve. Uh, you can see there are mobile echo densities off of it everywhere. And the leaflets are extremely irregularly thickened. And we put the color on and this time we see that same jet of aortic regurgitation, but we also notice that it looks like the leaflet has been perforated because it's not coming at where the leaflets are meeting each other, it's coming through the leaflet as well. So this is consistent with valve destruction, it's consistent with infective endocarditis. And this is just a short axis view of the aortic valve. Um, so we're seeing he has a normal three leaflet. Most people are born with a tri-leaflet valve, but again, very thickened sort of globs here and, and also in here um, on, the, on the cusp. And we went on to do a 3D look at that valve and you can see even more impressively how involved the leaflets of the valve are by these, what we call vegetations. So infectious material on the valves, we call vegetations. This is his mitral valve. Um, this is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is the posterior leaflet. Um, and we can see there's a little bit of um, an echo density that's mobile at the tip here. And this is also consistent with an infection um, of the mitral valve. Um, we see leakage. Uh, we see this sort of mosaic colored jet going backwards into the left atrium, consistent with leakage of that valve, probably due to these infectious material. This is the pulmonic valve. This is the hardest to see on transesophageal echo. Um, and you'll just have to trust me that's underneath the leaflets. Um, there's an echo density here that's mobile that shouldn't be there. It didn't show up quite well. So this man had infection on three out of four of his heart valves. But if that wasn't enough, when we looked at the wall between his left atrium and right atrium, we saw these very fine mobile echo densities sort of dancing off the wall. So we believe that these two uh, were vegetations due to the endocarditis. And we call this wall the intraatrial septum. So um, currently, because he has endocarditis, he's on six weeks, a very lengthy course of treatment 
with IV antibiotics and he's on two different antibiotics. Um, the team that was taking care of him in the hospital co uh, consulted the surger, surgeons. Um, and the reason they did that was they wanted them to weigh in whether he had any surgical reason or in, any indication for surgery. Now, typically we do the IV antibiotic treatment for six weeks. Obviously, if this fails and he has recurrence of bacteria in the blood, this would be an indication for surgery. Um, if he were to develop frank heart failure due to the uh, lesions or the vegetations on the valves and the regurgitant lesions, um, that would cause valve and, and, and that would be an indication for surgery if, if he's developing heart failure symptoms. Um, two or more events that we call embolic events, and that is when a piece of one of those vegetations breaks off and it goes somewhere. If they're on the left side of valves, the concern is it could cause a stroke. They could travel through the blood up to the brain, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and lodge in an artery, or they could go to a different artery elsewhere in the body, the spleen, the kidney. So two or more events means that this vegetation there is highly likely to break off. Now, Another indication for surgery may be the size of the vegetation. We know that on the left side of the heart, a vegetation more than a centimeter is more likely to break off and go places. Or, and on the right side of the heart, we give it a little bit more leeway and we say greater than two centimeters on, on the uh, right side. So the pulmonic and the tricuspid valves. Um, the interval development of heart block or a myocardial abscess would also be reasons for surgery. We did not see on our patient any indication of abscess. His EKG didn't show any evidence of heart block. So that is why the surgeon said, you know, let's see how he does with IV antibiotics. We'll probably bring him back after he finishes his six week course for another um, transesophageal echo, because sometimes we can see progression of the regurgitant lesions. Um, but this is just one example. So, um, so Laura, of a Laura um, yes. How did it, how did was his urinary tract infection that which seeded his heart valve? Oh, Ray, you just gave away one of the answers. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> but I, yes, I, I yes, in older I work, men, I it, are, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. In older men, it's very common for enterococcus faecalis to be the incident infection that then goes on to seed valves. Now, in a 75-year-old man, he may not have completely normal valves to begin with, meaning that he could have a little thickening there, the blood could be a little turbulent, but, and so we know that that's a susceptibility. And we know that this bacteria tends to love heart valves and the endocardium. Um, and thus, you know, it was the reason the infectious disease team asked for the echo. So yes, indeed, I believe that the urinary tract infection likely seeded uh, the heart valves. That's wild, you know, in my world of an urban, you know where I'm going with this of course, in my, in my world of an urban inter-city ER, vastly by far and away, IV drug use is where people get their heart valves screwed up, but. And, very and if it were a different, if it were a different, um, you know, First, uh, bacteria person. growing, if he had a history of IV drug use, certainly we see a lot of that, um, particularly at, at, I, I would say at Parkland, I think um, we see a lot of endocarditis due to IV drug use, sadly. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we'll go ahead on to our next case. And this is a 74 year old man who presents with chest pain and shortness of breath. And Ray, I have a question. Are you able to see my pointer on the screen? Yes, ma'am, it looks oh, just fine. Oh, good, good. I was worried you weren't and I was pointing for no reason. So, um, so this is a parasternal lawn access um, by transthoracic echo. So a couple things we notice, his heart's not squeezing so well. So he has what we call systolic heart failure. 
His left atrium is enlarged. His valves, his both his mitral valve and the aortic valve are both thickened. The mitral valve is opening though. We can see leaflet opening, but the aortic valve, I would be hard pressed to say that I see, on this view, we only see two of the three leaflets. And I don't, I don't really see a whole lot of opening here, which concerns me, especially since he's having chest pain and shortness of breath. When we put our Doppler probe through the um, aortic valve, we see that the velocity of the blood going through the valve is four times that of normal. His velocity is almost four meters per second. Um, it's at least twice. You can have a velocity between a meter to two meters per second and have normal valve opening but his is, is four uh, meters per second. So it, it's quite, quite large. So the concern is that he could have severe aortic stenosis. Um, aortic stenosis is a very uh, lengthy process that happens to valves. It can occur over decades of time. And during that initial stage, you're typically asymptomatic, meaning you may have a murmur detected on exam, but you're not having symptoms. The cardinal symptoms of aortic stenosis are chest pain, shortness of breath, and syncope, which is fainting. Um, once the, those symptoms begin, um, if you don't treat the aortic stenosis and there is no adequate medical therapy, you have to replace the valve. Um, so without valve replacement, you, the percent of patients surviving really goes quickly to 0% within two to five years. So once you develop these symptoms, average time of survival is only two to five years. And so there is some urgency because we don't know when that's when those symptoms are gonna to lead to fatal symptoms um, to get the valve replaced. Our patient we just saw had a trileaflet valve. So his aortic stenosis was acquired. And we used to call this calcific aortic stenosis um, more, and we more refer to it now as degenerative and almost, um, oh, this is wrong. I'm sorry. I should have proofed it. It should be 25% of people over the age of 65 have some form of this degenerative valve disease. So aortic stenosis is quite common. Um, you can also see that, um, with rheumatic valve disease, um, it's a little bit different morphology of the valve, but again, it can lead to aortic stenosis. So let me um, see if I'm, and, saying, I'm one sorry. In four people, one in four people over 65. Over 65 have some form of aortic stenosis. And then, you know, not all of them progress to severe, but a good portion do. So it's, that's why it's so common. It's, but it's, it's not common. It's not rheumatic in origin. It's what trauma? No, 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 no. The it, the most of it, it's degenerative. We think that the risk factors for coronary disease and aortic stenosis are very similar. So uh, lipids, hypertension. Um, oh. There's probably a genetic uh, predisposition as well that we don't quite understand. Um, but the you know smoking. Um, so there, there are many factors, but no, most of the valves that we see won't be rheumatic, but rheumatic valvular disease can cause aortic stenosis as well. The other, about 20% of people probably with aortic stenosis will have be born with it and have, cause a congenital valve is the most common, um, one of the most a bicuspid aortic valve is one of the most common congenital conditions you can have. They become symptomatic earlier than the degenerative group. So they develop symptoms usually by the sixth decade of life. Whereas people that get the acquired or the degenerative are typically in their seventies and eighties by the time they get symptomatic. 
So the name of the game is medical therapy doesn't work, but we need to replace the valve. And so until just recently, the only way you could do that was through an open sternotomy where the sternum is actually sawed in half um, and you have um, the ribs, everything, everything gets spread, pushed. You see the clamps here. The heart is put on um, cardiopulmonary bypass. So you, you have to, you know, um, circulate the blood, obviously, uh, throughout the body to protect the other organs. Um, the aorta gets uh, clamped here. Of course, the pericardium has to be opened to um, basically expose the heart. And then the aortic valve, which sits right under the aorta, you can't see it because I haven't opened it, um, needs to get exposed. And then if they need to do bypasses, here are the coronary arteries coming down that leads to a longer surgery with a higher incidence of morbidity and mortality. So you can imagine in a 80 year old who's very frail, um, you know, this is a lot of recovery that this takes, you know, you're on bypass, which people come out a little fuzzy after that. So if you're already going in, in with some cognition problems, it's probably not the best um, procedure, you know, for recovery of the brain. Um, so, and, and this shows the exposed um, implantation of a tissue valve uh, with sternotomy. And you see the clamps there, you see um, the aortic valve right here and sort of being sewn in. Um, and and uh, they would do testing as well to make sure there's no significant leak. What, 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 are, the valve, what are the valve leaklets made of, Laura? So they can be, it's of animal material and it's either cow or pig, uh, usually pericardium. Oh, but really? that's in the bioprosthetic valves. If you had a younger person, so say under the age of 55 or even 60, they would most likely get a mechanical valve. So the, that's, you know, made of metal, essentially. I, I didn't go into detail how we take care of both of those valves, um, but this is, a, this is a tissue valve. Okay. Um, so be, out of the concern for the many patients that couldn't go through an open procedure like that, grew the thought of, hey, if we can open people's arteries in the cath lab percutaneously, meaning putting a catheter in the femoral artery, bringing it up, going in, putting in a balloon, putting in a stent, just maybe we could do the same thing for an aortic valve. So I want to show you this, uh, hopefully, it, YouTube video, hopefully it will cooperate. And this transcatheter okay. aortic valve replacement procedure is performed on patients who have severe. Turn the audio up a little, Laura, if you can. Oh. And here you see an aortic valve that's not opening well. It's severely calcified. All right, good. Keep going. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. Right. And the leaflet motion is restricted. So to perform the TAVR or transcatheter procedure, a wire is inserted in the femoral artery. It is threaded up through the aorta and around the aortic arch. And then the, that wire is passed through the uh, stenotic aortic valve and placed in the left ventricle. Following that, a balloon catheter is passed over the wire into the stenotic aortic valve. The balloon catheter is then inflated opening up the stenotic valve, cracking the plaque and freeing up the leaflets. And that's in preparation for the stent valve or the, the transcatheter valve to be inserted. And the first rendition that you see is the first stage of the catheter going in and then the second stage of the catheter coming through around the aortic arch over the wire and it's gonna insert into the stenotic valve. Once the catheter is placed in the valve, the stented valve is ballooned open. 
pushing the diseased leaflets out of the way and leaving a functioning aortic valve in place. And you, then the wire is removed and you can see the leaflets of the aortic valve opening and closing, providing normal flow through the valve. So have a procedure. Oh, I'm going to just stop it there. Um, so this procedure has revolutionized how we take care of aortic stenosis. My grandmother passed away from aortic stenosis because she didn't want open heart surgery. Uh, she lived till 90. Um, I think if this procedure had been available, um, she would have had many more years of life because she was otherwise, you know, pretty healthy except for some osteoarthritis. Um, so it really has revolutionized the way we care for these patients. Um, and we now have routine meetings once a week to discuss patients that are awaiting surgery for valve replacement, because we have so many of them because it's so common, um, and discuss who is the right patient to go say for a surgical open procedure versus um, who needs one of the TAVR procedures. I'm just going to catheter aortic um, valve. Uh, Laura, we got a yeah. question is, are there concerns for any kind of biofilm development that might contaminate the valve? You mean down the road or when they're put, put in? Yeah, more likely when they're put in. So, I mean, the tri there have been many trials now, because this has been ongoing now for the past, been in development for the past 15 years. Um, and we have not seen any, any such issues. Um, the biggest problem is that the way the valve is deployed, you have to carefully size the valve. And we use, before we do the um, procedure, they will have a CT scan to look at the annulus, which is the area in which the valve gets deployed. Um, and the valves only come in certain sizes. It's not like you can custom request a 22 millimeter, 23, mil, you know, there are each company that makes them have, they have standard sizes. So the biggest thing is, can you get the right valve uh, to fit without there being a leak around the valve because it's maybe too small or because when it was, when you broke the plaque away, it was difficult because it was so much calcium there. The biggest um, comorbidity <laughs> has been resulting aortic paravalvular regurgitation, which means it's coming around the valve. Um, but, you know, over time, you know, we'll have to see, I mean, these valves can become stenotic over time. They can wear down over time, just like a regular tissue prosthetic valve. But keep in mind that we're putting them mostly in elderly patients um, that aren't suitable because they have a lot of comorbidities um, or they're too frail. So, it, and that's one of the reasons why we would choose a mechanical valve for someone that's younger and healthier. That hasn't changed. Those patients are still going to surgery. Um, so, and you know, when we do surgery and replace with a mechanical valve, um, they're typically more durable <laughs> than tissue valves. So the younger you are, the better off you are with a mechanical valve. So the surgical AVR is always going to be better in the younger and healthier population. Um, the elderly population, um, if you're elderly and very vigorous, say if you're a 70 year old, very vigorous patient, you don't have many comorbidities, maybe you have a little bit of hypertension, um, you would still be a candidate for a sat SAVR or a surgical AVR because, hey, you may live to 90 um, and this could be your only procedure. So the surgeons may opt to take you. But if you have multiple comorbidities like lung and kidney disease or cognitive issues or your functional status is very poor and they don't think you're going to go to cardiac rehab and do well after the procedure, then the TAVR is better because you have a shorter time in the hospital, 
maximum is usually two to three days um, versus five to seven days or even longer with a surgical AVR. Um, you don't have a big sternotomy on your chest. So you're back up and at your baseline pretty quickly. Um, you spend less time in bed after the surgery. Um, you know, they, I mean, after the TAVR procedure. So you're up and less risk of pneumonia or getting a DVT. Both okay. procedures carry the same risk of stroke. Um, and that's just the name of the game. They both carry that, but it's the same. Um, and if you have what's called a porcelain aorta, which many of our elderly patients do, it's just a very heavily calcified aorta where they can't find any place to clip without maybe disrupting or even fracturing the aorta, uh, which would be a fatal um, complication, then a TAVR is gonna be better. So that's just sort of, I wanted to give you a flavor of the quick pros and cons when you may go with a transcutaneous yeah. procedure. Uh, Laura, Laura, do you think, you think there will be custom fit sizes with time? Will technology go that way? Possibly, possibly. You know, I think the more and more people that become candidates and, mm -hmm. you know, we really have seen the TAVR, you know, um, uh, population grow because as the results and the techniques have become better, um, we've been able to, the, they've been able to basically include more people um, who would benefit from TAVR. So an example, maybe somebody that's undergoing, um, you know, chemotherapy and they think their prognosis is really good, but right now it wouldn't be a good time for them to undergo a surgical AVR. You know, that patient may very well be a, a candidate for TAVR, even if they don't have any other comorbidity, even if they are say middle age. So the population of patients getting TAVRs has really expanded. And you think, this is, you, oh, you, think 3D, you think 3D printing will, come into place with this sort of thing? Very possible. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's already, you know, assisting with um, uh, these, the design of the valves and everything. But I definitely think because, you know, we can get very detailed look of sort of the annulus beforehand. Um, and then, you know, we know sort of what we're going to need, but yeah, I think the sky's the limit on, on what we can do to tailor things. And I'm sure the companies would be all over that and probably already are. That we're just not privy to everything until, it, until it's out there. Um, but that's just a flavor. Um, you know, the aortic valve is not the only valve. We're doing um, percutaneous valves in the mitral um, position now. There's a, a device called a mitra clip that can help us you know, clip the leaflets of the mitral valve together. If the patient's not a candidate to go for surgery that has a severe leak in the mitral valve. So we're seeing an evolution in cardiology. Uh, we're taking over more procedures that used to be some more surgically based um, and, and being able to offer, to offer them to patient populations that are more sick. So it really is an exciting time. And this, this particular subspecialty, you know, the procedures are done by interventional cardiologists that have an interest in what we call structural heart disease. Um, it's almost additional training beyond just doing a heart cath and opening up a coronary. Um, so that's been a big field. We now have training programs in structural heart disease. Um, so it's an exciting time. And like I said, more and more patients are being, um, you know, uh, taken care of with these procedures. So I think we're really still in the infancy of what can happen. Unbelievable. Okay. So now we're going to go to case number three, and this is a very common occurrence probably happens a couple times a day at Parkland and oh, yeah. at CUH. So this is a 68 year old gentleman that's had intermittent chest pain for the past day. And for the last hour, he's had severe substernal chest pain that radiates to his left arm. 
And you can see he's kind of clutching his chest. And that is a sign called the Levine sign. Now, this is very classic. I would say in the elderly patients and in women, the sort of presentation may not be as classic. And that's something to keep in mind. So on physical exam, the man is uncomfortable. He's diaphoretic, which means he's sweating profusely, a lot of sympathetic output. And his blood pressure is low at 90 over 60, heart rate of 96. His EKG in the ER, and I hope this projects okay, shows what we call ST elevation in the anteroceptal leads and and the lateral leads. Um, concerning is that I already see evidence of a scar. He has also what we call Q waves, which is this downward deflection in V1 and V2. Um, so he correctly gets identifies as an ST elevation MI. And what an ST elevation MI means is that the artery is 100% closed. There is no blood getting by that and muscle is dying and it's dying every minute. So this is a, an emergency. This patient doesn't go to be admitted and wait for a bed and hang out and have his dinner. The emergency room directly contacts the STEMI pager and activates the cath lab because they have a patient down there and muscle is dying with every passing minute. Our goal as cardiologists is that the door to balloon time should be less than 90 minutes. So what that means is from the time he hits the door in the emergency room until the time the balloon is inflated should be less than 90 minutes. And this is a benchmark and hospitals get followed for this. And so, um, and it's important and it, it, it is, and I'm glad it's a benchmark um, because before that, you know, we were not perhaps, and definitely before the time we could put balloons down arteries and stents, um, you know, there was no rush to do this, but now there should be a rush because, um, you know, the outcomes really matter. So we are now in the cath lab and I just want to show, throw a picture up here of the cath lab. The patient's head, you can't really see, it's down here. And you can see there's a cardiologist standing here. This may be cardiology fellow over here, or this may be the cardiology fellow. Uh, and then we usually have a technician in there, an assistant. Um, so the first image that they take is this top panel here. And this is the, and they're in the left main coronary, which then bifurcates into the left anterior descending artery going to the apex and the left circumflex, which kind of goes down the back of the heart. But this is a great view to see the left anterior descending artery. And if you'll notice here, and I'll try to freeze it at the right, oops, that wasn't very good. I was gonna to try to freeze it at the right time, but where I have my pointer, you'll see there's a very tight blockage in stenosis. Obviously there's blood getting through that, but just barely, right? Um, so there is, we have the ST elevation, but it's just barely getting through. Sometimes you won't even see dye beyond the blockage. But in this case, he may have started sort of reperfusing a little bit on his own. So the first thing they'll do is they'll put a balloon down and get that inflated. And then the next is to put in a stent. And just in the interest of time, I didn't show you of all, all those shots, but I wanted to show you the final outcome. And you can see now in that same area that the blockage was, we have definite blood flow here. And you can see the artery even looks bigger compared um, to the top panel here. Um, so he typically will, at that point, if there were no other significant blockages, um, uh, he's gonna go back to the coronary care unit um, for his care. So he had what, again, just to recap, an acute ST elevation um, myocardial infarction. So last case, I think, yes, um, is a 55-year-old man. And he presents with increasing shortness of breath over a period of months. 
and episodes of syncope. He kept passing out with loss of, loss of consciousness. Um, he also reported intermittent fevers uh, for the past few several weeks. And physical exam, the only thing that was really abnormal is that it showed a low frequency murmur during diastole. And so because of this constellation of symptoms, he had an echocardiogram done. Let me just start play here. Okay, now I'm sure that people can probably see the abnormality. Um, this is an apical view of the heart. This is the left side of the heart. We typically in adult cardiology put the left ventricle, right ventricle on the top and the atria are on the bottom. So this is the right atria. This is the left atrium. And this little guy definitely should not be there. This is a huge mass and it looks like it is attached to the interatrial septum, this wall between the right and left side of the heart. And it's prolapsing through the mitral valve. This is what we call just a left atrial myxoma. This is actually a benign, quote unquote, benign cardiac tumor, meaning unlike a classic malignancy, a malignant tumor, it doesn't metastasize um, through the bloodstream and set up, you know, uh, growth elsewhere. Um, it's most frequently attached to the intraatrial septum, which is this wall again between the right and left side of the heart. Now, this isn't the only abnormality on this. You'll notice here the tricuspid valve leaflets don't even close. And that is because, and you can see the right ventricle looks bigger than the left ventricle, which never should be. So this right heart is very dilated, um, likely due to the fact that not much blood flow can even get through because of this big mass. So he has sort of backflow of blood through the pulmonary circulation, really um, dilating up the right side of the heart. Um, so clearly this has been going on for a while. If I had shown you a picture of a color, you would have seen that he has wide open leakage of the tricuspid valve as well. Um, so what is the management of such a remarkable um, sort of benign tumor? Well, it's not really benign, right? Um, not when they get that big. And typically, if you find a myxoma and the patient is healthy and they can su survive the cardiac surgery, it's preferable to surgically remove the tumor. And the reason for that is that these tumors are going to keep growing. And so um, they can, and like in this patient, obstruct the inflow of blood to the left ventricle and cause pulmonary hypertension. <laughs> excuse me, which is high pressure in the lung vasculature. And this puts strain on the right side of the heart and can eventually lead to right heart failure. Pieces of this tumor can actually often break off and they can cause embolic events elsewhere in the body, like the brain causing a stroke, or just like in the endocarditis patient, it can go it can go anywhere. It can go to the kidney. It could go to the spleen. Um, it can also cause an inflammatory syndrome with this, which this patient had. Um, he was having fevers and if left long enough can um, progress to weight loss and malaise. Um, even after you surgically remove these tumors, they need to be, have surveillance for life because they can recur. And there's actually a familial uh, form of this type of tumor that's related to a syndrome where you can have multiple of these um, uh, tumors within the heart um, and it's genetically passed. And so it occurs and runs in families. Um, so there's always, when one of these is identified in the echo lab, there's always a lot of excitement just because it's you know a remarkable imaging finding. Um, and like I said, the majority of the patients uh, will get referred for surgery. And I should mention they can, the left atrium is just the most common place that tumor may be found, but it can be found in any of the um, chambers of the heart. Hey, Laura. Yes. Like 25 years ago, I had a young man come to the ER one day and he said, you know, whenever I sit up, I pass out. 
<laughs> yeah. And I went, yeah, whatever. And I examined <laughs> the guy. I didn't, you know, this is 25 years ago. Yeah. And I, I didn't find much. And so I, I called his family medicine doc, who was a very attentive fellow. He said, well, fine, send him to the office tomorrow. I said, okay. I went back in and told the guy, I said, okay, fine, we're going to send you to the office tomorrow. And he went to sit up and he passed out in front of me. <laughs> and I said, you're not going anywhere. And we admitted Good him to the you. hospital. And in fact, it was not a mixoma. It was a atrial sarcoma. Oh, this guy, had, he, so had cancer of the heart. he had cancer of the heart. Yeah. Unfreak, unfreaking believable. It just goes to show that rare or not, it happens sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. The, we, well, you know, it's, we know that if we take out the myxoma, that patient's going to be pretty much as good as new, but I've, I've had some sad cases of the sarcomas and they always seem to happen in young people. Um, so it's that, that is definitely a sad, a sad case, at least with the myxoma, we can assure the patient, Hey, you're going to feel so much better. This is going to come out. You'll have to come back and visit us once a year or so for echoes, but it, you know, we're going to be able to actually make a cure here. Um, so I just wanted to end and leave you with some pearls and tips for your journey. Okay. And I think this was already brought up in the chat, but I strongly believe in whatever subspecialty or specialty you go into. And even if you don't decide on medicine, you do something else, you have to find balance in your life. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful. I felt very fortunate. I didn't delay having children. And, um, you know, that's a struggle for a lot of women that, that do delay and then have, you know, fertility problems down the road. So, um, you know, I, I value my friends and I make time for them. Um, I still have hobbies and, and volunteer. Um, so please, please, if I can, you know, make a plea, just find balance. Um, importantly, I think everybody needs mentors, right? It, it always takes a village. Um, so I would say find a mentor at every stage. You may need more than one mentor at each stage um, because you may need somebody to help you decide about clinical. You may have a research interest. So you may, you may need mentors, you know, um, more than one and that's okay. Um, and I'd encourage it starting at the high school, college level and all through your training. And even when you're a junior faculty, I think people really still need mentors. Um, going back to sort of what I consider my mistake in medical school, um, I would make certain anybody writing a letter for you is really on your side. Meaning that I would interview them. I would say, hey, I'm, I'm considering asking you for a letter, but I want it, I'm going to give you my CV and I'd like to come in and, and talk with you first about you know, my career plans. And then I'm going to get back to you. Um, you know, and I think that that's something, you know, and I think it's okay to say after you've met with someone, you know, thank you so much for your time. And I, I think um, I, I actually, after all, I'm not, I'm not going to need your letter. Um, and, you know, you may get asked why um, it may be a little, you know, a little bit dicey, but um, you know, you can let them down gently, but I think it's more important that you're sure that whoever's writing letters for you are really in your court. And I think um, you can start that process by if you're an undergrad that you're if you have an interest that Professor X is going to, you know, write your letter at the time a year from now or months from now that you go and you meet them in office hours and maybe go to their office hours. And I think, you know, you can draw a pencil on the way. Hey, I'm thinking of this career and I'm thinking of doing this. And you're not even asking them at this point to write a letter. You're just kind of interviewing them on this on the sly, so to speak. Um, but I think it's better than you know what I've heard stories of are people going like a week before their letters do, or even a couple weeks, and maybe they go see a professor they've never really even met in person. They've only met virtually, or they've met them. Um, you know, seeing them in class, but never sat down and had a conversation. So I would just make sure you're familiar with who writes your letters and make sure they're in your court. Um, well, you know, uh, you know, Laura, I, uh, I recall 
we've seen many of these, you and I have, but a, an example was, <clears throat> Uh, I'm writing this letter for Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones says that he was in my biology 300 class. I don't remember him, but he made an A minus, so he must be a good student. <laughs> right. I would expect he might be a good doctor. Thank you. You know, that is a non-letter, folks. You don't want a letter like that. Right. And I, I don't think you want a letter from, you know, when I think back about that very prominent um professor who I asked for a letter because I thought we got along great on the rheumatology service. In retrospect, knowing that she wasn't in my court about my future plans, I think if I were in my shoes now and could try time travel back, I, I would have asked, her, you know, politely asked her not to write one. So um, get diverse exposure when you're in medical school and when you're in your training, like if you're in internal medicine or you're doing surgical training, but you think you're going to subspecialize, really don't narrow too quickly. Make sure you get broad exposure. And I would say, um, you know, both for clinical and research, you know, with research, you may need to find out, are you more likely to be happy doing clinical outcome research, or are you more going to be sort of doing physiology or bench? And so definitely get involved if you can, if you think that's going to be part of your life. And another pearl I cannot stress enough, and this applies to every level, outsource what you can or you do not enjoy. So if, if cleaning your house does not bring you happiness, as soon as you can afford it, get someone else to do it. Um, you know, what makes you happy, I wouldn't get rid of. Um, I think that, you know, as you go on, you have to cut certain things out because I realized I couldn't have elaborate plants once I had children because I needed to take care of my kids. And so my sister adopted all my plants. And so you have to kind of do things like that as, as you go on, you have to make those choices of where you wanna spend your time. Um, and it's okay to take a break from your journey. We see a lot of students doing this now with gap years, but I would encourage you if you do do it to try to be productive during those years. Um, you know, don't you, cause somebody inevitably is going to ask you, well, what did you do in your gap year? You know, and if you say, well, I kind of sat home watching Netflix and that's all you have to show for it. That's, that's not going to be very cool. But if you traveled and maybe visited, you know, clinics in another, you know, country that had, you know, different practices than you have seen here, um, or, you know, it will make you appreciate so much more, you know, and con contrast and compare how things are done differently, um, then that's something you can really talk about. Or maybe you've been itching to do, you know, research with somebody. And um, now you definitely have this year and you can find out if this is for you. So I would just encourage you, if you're going to take time to, and a break off from the journey, that's okay. But just try to do some, just try to have something to show for it. And then lastly, um, I didn't go into in detail. I've certainly been thrown um, several curveballs um, in, in my years during my journey. And I just say, you have to be ready for them. And sometimes you're never ready, um, but you have to be able to bounce back. And uh, before I turn it back to Dr. Fowler and Elena, I just wanted to leave you with some of my favorite um, medical authors, um, because I think um, these three are just outstanding and I've really enjoyed their books. And um, I wanna thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to come and chat with so many people and happy to answer any questions. Laura, what a wonderful talk. Uh, I, have, oh, uh, Gawande's, uh, I, I have Gawande's book on the front seat of my car right now. <laughs> so uh, it is marvelous. Let's have everybody please uh, put a thank you, Dr. Collins, into chat so she can oh. see how much almost oh, 170. I want to let, let you know that that's something that I still do is that I belong to a book club. We don't necessarily read medical books, but yes. So mm -hmm. that's another way I find, I find balance. I still read for pleasure. Laura, so you have been so time. Let's, 
Elena, let's pick yeah. one or two questions and then we'll let uh, Dr. Collins off the hook. <laughs> yes, that sounds good. <laughs> So one question we have is, do you work closely with PAs? And then what types of procedures can PAs perform in cardiology? Good question, good question. So um, I do, I work both with uh, PAs and I work with nurse practitioners. Um, so, you know, and I do like mostly non-invasive, um, so I'm not necessarily right with them doing procedures, but I'm aware of what procedures are available for them to assist with and to do. Um, I mostly work with PAs, um, in the hospital, um, and in the clinics, so the, in the hospital, the PA and in, in the outpatient setting, Physicians assistants are often um, responsible for doing uh, stress testing. And so that may be any type of stress testing running on the treadmill, or it may be that they're supervising infusion of uh, dobutamine, which is a medication we use to stress the heart. Um, so that's definitely within my realm, what one procedure that they do. Now they do um, participate in the cath lab, both the PAs and um, um, medical uh, and nurse practitioners. So I, I am aware at, at least at Clements University Hospital um, that now they're doing right <coughs> heart catheterizations. Um, so that's where we go in not to do coronaries, but we measure the pressures on the right side of the heart. So that's an invasive procedure that they're doing. Um, I have a good friend that's a PA who worked with the cardiothoracic surgeons for years and um, would be um, responsible for doing the saphenous vein graft harvest where we take um, a large vein out of the leg. And so she was involved um, with doing the saphenous vein graft. Um, we have, you know, assistants in, in the cath lab. I don't think we have right now any nurse practitioners routinely in there doing left heart caths with um, the interventionalist, but I know at some places that they, they <laughs> do assist. Um, but the, that's just, you know, and of course they see patients, um, independently in the clinics. Um, and then we work closely with them in the hospital, um, on the, the cardiology service as well. Okay. And then another question I have, I know you touched based on the, on this a little bit, but what is something you wish you knew before you started your path? Hmm. Well, I guess I wish I knew there would have been as many curve balls. <laughs> um, that, that's one thing. I, um, and I probably wish I started outsourcing things earlier and made so, sort of more time for recreation and fun things. Hey, Laura, the, uh, the great Harvard geologist, Stephen Jay Gould, Mm -hmm. who was one of the prominent evolutionists. He's, he's passed a few years ago, but he was a great man. And he said, the tape of life, think videotape or cassette tape, the tape of life, if rewound, would not play the same way a second time. Too many, too many coincidences about things. And boy, my life has been full of coincidences that could have turned me to a different, to a different path. Mm -hmm. And then, Laura, I would never have known you for almost 10 years on the admissions committee where you and I have screened almost 10,000 actual interviewed candidates over the space of a decade. And so, Laura, we are very, very genuinely grateful for you taking the time this evening to come out and be part of this. You had 170 people sitting wow. on the edges of their chairs, loving everything that you said. And this was just tremendous. And if I were going to ask for any last I remember, uh, you know, the faculty club, as you know, turns into a bar at two o'clock in the afternoon. And um, <laughs> Melvin, the bartender there, uh, the students here have heard me tell it this. And I was sitting there when Mike Brown came in one day and I was with a bunch of students. Mike is a Nobel laureate, as you know, Laura, and uh, who discovered the LDL receptor, something in your yeah. bailiwick. And uh, I said, Mike, uh, as we finished our drink, do you have any words for these students? And Mike leaned forward and he looked 
he pointed at them and he said, it's all about the patient. And I was going, holy cow, that's exactly right. And so yeah. if you're going to have parting words for 170 kids from all over the world, from uh, Qatar to Australia tonight to Thailand, what would you say to them about a career in medicine? Yeah, I mean, what Mike said, I mean, that, that is so right. Um, I, I think I would encourage, I think we're losing um, a little bit about how important history taking is, meaning one-on-one -on -one, talking to the patient about what they're really feeling their actual complaints are. Um, I think there are too many forms that get filled out and checklists that get done. Um, so I think t really taking the time, especially when you first meet that person, of just letting them talk and be a good listener is so incredibly important. Um, and then the other thing I want everybody to do, Abraham Bergace has a wonderful TED Talk. Ray, I think it's the one I told you about. And it's about the touch, the touch of a physician. I think it's like 2014, 2016. But if you go to TED Talks, type his name um, and it's the touch and how much you can learn from the touch. Meaning that, you know, when you go in to see a patient, don't stand back from their bedside, lean into them, be with them. Um, and for God's sakes, examine them. I mean, it's, it's a losing art, I, I think, um, that, that we're sometimes in the rush of the moment and everything. People put a stethoscope on the chest and they may pick one spot that's not even important. And then they really haven't listened to the heart. So take the time to touch your patients because it gives them some comfort. Um, I, I can still remember some patients come into my office and saying that they were so upset. And the reason they changed doctors was because they had a doctor that never touched them. And I said, what do you mean never touch? And you know, they were saying, well, they never examined me. And I, I think that it's definitely an art form that's, that's being lost. But I think being there, listening to them, and um, especially when they're in the hospital, that human touch is important. So listen to Vergesi's uh, TED Talk, because it's wonderful. You know, Laura, I think as we wrap up here, what you just said is, it really encapsulates the evening. I, uh, I'm an old man, no kids. Yeah, you know, I just never had a family. And so the most social thing that I really do is going to work. And I love being around the staff. I enjoy the techs. I enjoy the nursing staff and the other docs. But I really, really enjoy the patients. Go in, sit down. I sit on the bed with the patients and I hold their hand and I talk to them. Yeah. And, you know, it is, it, it is an important two-way street that we are validating the importance of them being with us today. Right. And we are letting them be able to trust us. Right. And, and Laura, I think that is the future of our field. And we've got to keep going there. And we got to show the kids, let them see us do that. Absolutely. So, so that we can help folks move from states of unwellness to better wellness, don't you think? Absolutely. Right. And again, thank you so much for inviting me. I had a blast and <laughs> you know, it's going to make me plow through my day at Parkland tomorrow because, oh, you're, you know, well, Laura, it's we're gonna, great to meet we're everyone. Gonna put your, uh, we're going to put your talk on the website and probably over the next couple of months, about 5,000 people will watch this wonderful talk. Each one of those is a future healthcare professional who will see a hundred thousand patients in a career 5,000 times 100,000, Laura, is a half a billion. You've touched tonight a half a billion lives, and we are so grateful. Well, thank you, Ray, and I'll be seeing you around. <laughs> okay. Elaine, All you right. want to wrap up? We got a next slide, uh, Laura, I think. Can you click oh, oh so sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Um, uh, if you could do one more slide. There we go. Perfect. All right, here's the assessment, uh, number 83, and it will be due next week at... 6.59 Central Standard Time. 
And then uh, the session five quiz is just posted in the chat. If you guys want to go ahead, if you guys haven't done it yet, uh, go back on YouTube and rewatch the video. Uh, you will get a certificate for completing that session. Thank you, Elena. Dr. Collins, thank you so much. And to all of you out there virtual shadowing, we are so very grateful that you would join us again. <clears throat> We're going to give you a couple of weeks off. I believe that that right, Elena, in the video. We're going to let you finally take a couple of weeks off and yep. <laughs> give you some time to be with your families over the holidays. And we will be here to crank back up again in January. And we look forward to a next year with you. So on behalf of Dr. Collins, whom we thank so much, and on behalf of the whole virtual shadowing team, we wish you a good evening and a good night.